Hello, everybody. Thank you for welcoming me today. Thanks for the organization. Um, very happy to be here. Very happy to hear a lot of uh, people interested in VR and design. And in particular, very happy to hear uh, this presentation from before, where they place the body. And thank you, Max, also for placing the body at the center of the discussion on VR. I won't speak about the technology. I would rather like to give a very quick, of course, 15 minutes, too short, but a few insights in uh, what I believe are the new interesting approaches in a conjunction between cognitive sciences and virtual reality. So I don't have to repeat that. Everybody has heard about it or should have had. Um, there is immersion on one side. We know what it is. We know this process. We know the mechanistic uh, technological loop and we know that on the other side, this produces this weird feeling of, oh, this is real. This is not new, of course, from the 90s already. And it is interesting to remind you that the graphics were very poor compared to today, but still the experience was there. And as you can see, there is a lot of ways to achieve this presence, this sense of being there, or this illusion of uh, this suspension of disbelief, this illusion of being in a place where you're not exactly. So do we know that, does this work, this mediation of things? Yes, indeed. Everybody knows how to do it. You are all able to do that. Do you know why this works in your, in your brain, in your mind, or in the brain of your audience? So we, we don't really know. It is like this. You all know about optical illusions. You all know that this is not true. Although you cannot help but see these disks are turning. And if I were to ask you this typical question about your presence in VR, it would be the same as asking you, well, how strong is the feeling that these disks are turning? It's really subjective experience. Only you can know. Only you can experience it. Everybody has a different experience. But I know you are a human being. Non-human beings get away. <laughs> and you all have this illusion, because I know how the system and the neurons and the visual system work. So that's why we also know that this works. You, many of you know it already. I just played for the fun of it. <laughs> so you saw what happened, no? Huh? I will play just the, the, the one bit which is funny. So during this moment, this poor subject just doesn't see his real hand and sees a really ugly plastic hand, the rubber hand. But what happens is that this gentleman here is touching both simultaneously, we say synchronously. So what is happening for the subject? Well, I feel the touch, I see the touch, therefore, this is my hand. When it got threatened, of course, what does he do? He removes the threatened hand. He does not remove the other one, which is closer to the threat. So it's really not a pure reflex thing. It's really targeted to where, hey, this is my body, you're hurting my body. So what we do in the lab, we're doing the same, but for the full body. So the idea being, can I make you feel that this is completely another body, this is a rubber body. Well, we do the same, we stroke the back of people, like the rubber hand, with a long stick, very high technology, and what happens then? Well, our experience of being inside this body is also processed this way, it's a perception. So this is what I would like to really, the core of the message today is, you know you have a body, you know this is your body, this is an experience that I have, but it's not for granted. I am experiencing it all the time. This is something I can alter, I can have a, a subjective control on also. And my brain, if altered through some uh, problems of uh, disease or, uh, or simply drugs, creates a weird experience sometimes. And experimentally, that's what we do. Another group does something similar. The idea here is that I would bring towards you 
an object which would then, in the virtual view, would be just approaching me. But at the same time, the experimenter is also touching you. But you don't see that. What you see is an image from the back. So the camera behind here is catch, capturing the object towards you, and what you see is the object towards you. But what you also see is yourself. So what is happening there? Well, I am the one touch, being touched. I am the point of view in the world. So what is this body in front of me? It's not anymore my body. They do a bit of measurement about this, and then you have the, the scores in this area there of the reaction, the conductance, galvanic skin response, so it gets higher uh, when you got stressed. And instead of touching with a piece of cotton there, you would straighten the body you see with a knife. But of course, it's a plastic body, so it doesn't do anything. But because you see this as your body, then you, you also react. So this is very normal for people doing games. So the questions we do ask in our lab are, is, was it, what is it to have a body? What makes this one my particular body? How do I know this is my body? Can I change for another body? Can I have two bodies? It works. We do it, huh? We did it two bodies. You identify two together. Can I safely, huh, safely leave my body? Can I change of body or can I have no body at all? And this question is, of course, very weird in the context of neuroscience or reality. In reality, this looks like, oh, pff, what are they? What is a weird question? But in virtual reality, this makes complete sense. I mean, the virtual body you have can be very well changed, can be two, can be another one. Typically, you know, certainly, the research of Mel Slater. And this is a famous experiment he did where you experience being Sigmund Freud. So when you look at yourself in the mirror, well, I am an old guy, I'm very wise. So then they can start to play action roles with yourself. Oh, I am Sigmund Freud, I'm analyzing you. Then you play the other guy. Oh, I have a problem with my girlfriend. Then you go back to being Sigmund Freud. Hmm, tell me more about your mother, and etc. <laughs> and you play yourself, your own psychoana psychoanalyst, and people do enjoy and have a much stronger uh, feeling of being empowered in asking the questions and having the right questions because they play the role of Sigmund Freud. So that's a, one of the bit extreme ones, but very seriously, he does, um, Mel Slater does a lot of this experience where you embody a black person, black skinned person, or as a white in the Western con community, but it could be the opposite. And just a few minutes of being in a black person makes you feel less racist, makes you feel better at playing drums, makes you change your... No, it's true. It, it, it has impact you. So being a, in another body makes you different. And you would say, well, it's complicated to be in a full body different thing. And that's where neuroscience comes to, to tell you that it's not that complicated. So we've got this virtual mirror little thing. So imagine you are sitting in front of a television which actually acts as a virtual mirror so that the head that you see in front of you is moving like you do. So I think the movie shows it. So the idea being that the participant here, we had only a, a 3D face of a, of, a, of a female, so only women came, and they were just doing that movement in front of that virtual mirror. And what they saw was the avatar doing the same thing. And you see the avatar, it was like 10 years ago, it was not that great, not super beautiful, and not very realistic. Again, the uncanny valley idea. The thing is that, uh, although this didn't look realistic, people, after only two minutes, were asked again to judge if they were looking like themselves, so the photo on the left is exactly a picture of themselves, or like the avatar, the picture on the right is uh, just a picture of that. And of course, we made all the scans in between, Meaning the 50-50 line is where you would make the mistake. So in normal situation, you are asked, well, is it more you? In a 50-50 blending, you are 50-50 chance. Now you have the blending which is 40% you and 60% the other. And in normal situation, I recognize it's more the other, it's less me. 
But after two minutes of just a virtual mirror, I habituate and being and looking like this girl, suddenly my perception of who I look like shifts towards a 60, 40%. Two minutes. That means you playing an avatar, looking at you in the mirror, oh, I'm Lara Croft, oh yes. And now you feel like you are Lara Croft. And that works very, very quickly. The same when you do this virtual reality experience. This one, you were, uh, we tested only male. They were um, embodying a virtual girl body. A little girl in, a, in this shirt, in this skirt, red skirt. So what you just saw is that him, he's looking down, and what does he see? He sees the girl's body. But what happens then is that the woman in front of him and the experimenter simultaneously would touch his shoulder. So I would play the trick of this congruency of the tactile and vision. And what he sees is this woman. So when he looks down, he sees he's a girl. The woman is really touching him. And when you have the thing synchronous, this is what we have. We see first that the first person view, I see I am in the body, is of course very strong for identifying to that body. If in the condition we had were separated a bit on the side, of course less strong. But also what mattered very much was this congruency. So if I feel the touch at the same time in synchrony with what I feel physically and what I see with a girl, a woman touching me, then of course this boosts and have uh, boosts the feeling and the questionnaire results on do you feel this is your body, do you feel this is real, do you think you are this uh, girl, do you feel you're wearing this clothing, etc. So that's to say that experimentally, what is ex also experimented, but in a less scientific way in, uh, in your labs or when playing to, do, um, to design new games, you are exploring all this. And uh, it has been most of the time, a lot of the time explored already. This is an example on uh, agency. So the idea being that you control your avatar. You know how you do, etc. But now imagine when you walk, your avatar does the same thing than you, but you have your real avatar and you have the one which is distorted. It goes, it shifts to the side. So you see at the beginning they are together, but one of the two is going to the side. And you only see the one which is going to the side. So when I'm, you are asked, go from A to B, but your avatar is actually shifting. So I'm going this way, I want to reach this, but my avatar is going to the left. So what do I do? I come let's do it the other way. <laughs> Basically what happens is that you compensate because you see the feedback loop, it's not correct, so you compensate. So you would say, like the 40 degrees of uh, view, there is a threshold, of course, among which, below which you don't notice, above which you start to really notice. And this is interesting to understand, not only for VR, but also for knowing how our brain works for that. And here it's interesting to see that in this case, the threshold is rather big, like more than 10 degrees, 12 degrees of distortion. 12 degrees, it's not one, it's not half, it's 12 bloody degrees. It's a lot. That means you don't notice, you still, you, do, might, you might do notice, but you still embody this avatar as being yours. You still say, well, no, it's okay, it was me doing that, yes, yes. So imagine the flexibility you have as designer of VR games. I mean, redirected walking is, uh, of course, uh, uh, use of that. But that means there is a lot of other things which can be explored. In this more recent work, we also do the classic pit room illusion, etc. You have to do uh, embody this avatar. Here we just show, uh, he's looking at the head-mounted display. We just display behind what he sees. And you have this little... Uh, physical thing which you can touch to feel the thing and you have the, of course, the ground with fall and we measure the skin conductance responses to see if there is a difference in their view. So we had different conditions, the classic. Huh? One was I see in first person view, one was I see in third person view, so I'm behind my avatar but I'm controlling it. And of course, we did uh, uh, the other complementary thing where it was not you in control, so just to have the experimental design properly. But we add in one more design um, idea. What if people can swip, switch between one and third person view? And that's where it was interesting, a sort of a discovery if you want. 
The first person view is obviously the one which gives the stronger sense of, okay, this is me, I see myself, of course. Third person view, though, does work. I can control this avatar, I can do stuff, and I can answer to the score, ah, is it, do you feel this is your body? Well, okay, yes, it does what like I do, so it's, I embody this thing, like in the uh, out-of-body experience I showed before. But still, the scores are lower. When you have a discrepancy, I'm done. <laughs> so when you have a discrepancy, meaning, okay, here the floor was not correct, or things like that that we voluntarily control for, well, the third person views and become very low score, of course, because then nothing works anymore. Why the first person view was stronger? Well, it's me. I can't help thinking it's me, although the things on the world have problems. And that's where it's interesting. The third, the switching condition, which was you are allowed to choose. You press a button, third person view. Press the button, first person view. And I choose whenever I want. And all the scores for this mode, which allowed control of my view, were the same than in the first person view. Meaning people can consider, oh, I'm out of my body. Well, it's completely normal. No problem, as far as I can go back into my body when I want. So that's maybe a design idea for you. I will not show this one. Well, also, I can just say we are experimenting also in medium which are not virtual reality, which are video reality, mixed reality, whatever you call it, intermediate reality. But basically, the idea is that you take real images of the world, you take real images of yourself, and you blend them together, and what happens? Well, you got a virtual mixed reality thing, and that's what we work on, so that we can have the real body distorted. Here, our first prototype, it was to show that we can uh, have control of the color and have a control of what we do. Of course, not very impressive technically, but for our experimental design, that shows that we can do now experience of body distortion or body disownership in many conditions. And where do we go with that? Well, we want to do fMRI because the idea being that, hey, having the knowledge, the understanding of how the brain reacts during the VR is, would be interesting. But you know, in, v, in the fMRI, you cannot move the head. So this is one interesting research question we have, and how to have virtual reality in the proper way without moving the head. And another idea we're also exploring, how to do virtual reality without graphics. So I liked very much your idea of the audio virtual reality, and it's augmented reality. Here, you can do feeling of a presence, you can have the feeling of being, having someone touching you, just because with this robotic uh, system, you induce these states of, oh, it's me touching me, but it's not really me, so who is touching me? Am I the one in front of me touch, being touched, or am I the one behind myself touching myself? Where is the self? I get lost, and that's on this that I will thank you for your attention. Thank you.